every spare minute I could get, I was studying Hebrews out of that set of books, and it absolutely revolutionized me. I, I, I was forever, once I got started in that, my view of the inspiration of Scripture was totally locked. There was never any question after that whatsoever. Nobody, nothing could have shaken me about the inspiration of Scripture. My view of the sovereignty of God was totally locked. Um, my view of the importance of the blood and redemption of Christ was totally locked. All those things that are Hebrew themes. Uh, um, do you have a particular reason for saying Hebrews 12, 1, 2, is it just a favorite devotional passage? Yes. Any, any, thing, any regard as to the place in the book of Hebrews? Yeah, for the chapter, for the, for the passage? See, the reason I ask is 12, 1, and 2, uh, the chapter divisions are supplied a long time after the New Testament was completed, 1,500 years. And they were, they were made up by a guy traveling on horseback. <laughs> and so some of them miss the, miss the divisions. You can easily see this in some passages. In fact, take a moment, hold your place in Hebrews, turn back to 1 Corinthians, and I'll show you. Well, I think I see what you mean, because it starts, therefore, so so there you are. referring back to... Yeah. So you, anybody reads incrementally, they tend to end the reading at the end of a chapter, and if they start the next day, they'll tend to miss that wherefore. What the connection is, turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, and I'll show you a classic example of this. <clears throat> Look at verses 30, 31. We'll start with 1 Corinthians 10, 31. And we go through 33. It says, whether therefore ye eat or drink. Now, let me give you a little, just a quick clue about that therefore because we're hitting this cold turkey and you probably don't know or, or you might remember if I tell you you might not remember otherwise but 8, 9, and 10 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10 is the greatest single passage in the Bible on how to deal with questionable things things that don't have a total moral shade of either black or white they're uncertain they're in the middle for example previous day it would be like going to movies and things like that and, and many honestly do not know what to do they're caught in a, in a quandary in a limbo of uncertainty about some moral issues and so Paul tells you how to deal with those that's in 8, 9, and 10 and in verse 31 he says whether therefore ye eat or drink this is 1 Corinthians 10, 31 or whatsoever you do do all to the glory of God. Now that in itself will resolve a lot of those issues. In other words, if you live to, 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 to effect the glory of God, that will automatically lay aside some practices. That will dismiss, like dirty clothes, some practices. And he says no matter what you do, eat, drink. He's been talking about meat offered to idols, so he's got eat and drink on the mind. He says, whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now listen carefully to this. This is a, another one of those cosmopolitan passages from the pen of Paul. And they slip in almost as a science. They don't look like a main part of the argument. It's almost God saying, oh, by the way. And it's interesting how in the New Testament so many of the greatest things the Holy Spirit tells us sound like a science. Oh, by the way, John 3.16, for example, is not a part of the argument of John 3. It's God saying, oh, yes. <laughs> and all it is is John 3.16. All right, look at verse 32. This is King James Bible. Give none offense. That is, do not put a stumbling block in anybody's way. Is what that literally says. Neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Now, there's an entire theology between the commas and the punctuation there. What does it mean to not put stumbling blocks in the path of the Jews first? Well, don't answer that. Just think. Secondly, what 
would you do to deliberately not put stumbling blocks in the path of the Gentiles? That's the second one. Number three is what would you do or what would you not do if your determination was to not put stumbling blocks in the path of the church of God or, or the saints, you and I? In other words, there are, there are categories there where certain things will cause those people to stumble. So in order to be fair to them, you should clear those things out of your life when you get around those people. Now notice, you might be able to do something with saints that you couldn't do with Jews. You got any ideas what would one of them be? I'm sorry, you said serve Jesus. No, no, what, what could, tell me something you could do with the saints of God and still not put a stumbling block in their path, but you couldn't do it around Jews. Eat pork. All right, eat pork. That's a good example. Kosher things. So, so see, that's what this passage is about. These are shady areas. See, a, a, a simplistic legalist would say, I'll get rid of all of them. No, that's not, that's not life. And, and uh, Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10 deal with all of these things. So see how carefully, how, how needful it is that we park here until we understand what he's saying. Don't put any stumbling block in the area of anybody. And then he gives three categories, each of which has distinctive stumbling blocks that none of the others has. So he says, don't put a stumbling block in anybody's pathway. Now look at verse 33. Even as I please all men in all things. Now of course he doesn't mean dogmatically that he pleases everybody. You can't please everybody. He means it's my goal to please everybody, not seeking my own profit. And here's the reason he tries to please everybody, but the profit of many that they may be saved. In other words, I want to remove every obstacle from the man's pathway that I might have a part in in order to maximize his possibility to be saved. Now, that's the end of the chapter in our chapter divisions. But look at the first verse of verse 11. <laughs> See, there, there shouldn't be any chapter division there. This is the conclusion of what he's just said. Be ye followers of me. See, I don't put any stumbling. I try to please all men in all things, he says. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now, that's one of the greatest uh, disciple-making verses in the Bible. The word, well, let's look that word up. Here's a good place to start. Now, I'll show you how to use vines. Now, since it's a dictionary of New Testament word, words, what's the key word of chapter 11, verse 1 there? What's the big word? Oh, Followers. Or yeah. And what is your translation? Imitate. Imitate. Excellent. What's the what's the translation? New King James. New yep. King James and New American. New American. Okay, the New word American. the word is imitates. It's the word from which we get our word imitate, to imitate or imitators or mimics Mimic. is the word. And so he says, be mimics of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now Notice another thing here. This is not talking about our faith identification with Christ. This is talking about Christ as our example. See, I follow Christ because of the example he set for me. You follow me. You follow my example even as I follow Christ's example. See, we follow him, but then there's an entirely different doctrine of our union with him. Our union with Him is the basis of our following Him. But if we only have union with Him, we won't know what to do. So the Bible gives us the picture of His example so we'll know what we're to do in following Him and mimicking Him. You can't mimic somebody if you don't know what they do. That's a gigantic passage. Let me take that word followers and show you how this, this book works. Uh, Ralph, what are you working off of there? Uh, this is the... Uh Lexicon. Okay, whose? Do you know? Is it a Strong's? Let me go back and I'll tell you what. I got two different things. Like, Dang, yeah, they're I'm telling you. Wow. Uh, Look at that. <laughs> I've got uh, Strong's yeah. Lexicon and then the HG Theological Lexicon. That's what I was reading. Uh, that's the 
That's Hebrew and Greek. Theological lexicon. Lexicon. Okay. I've also got the NAS, uh, NAS exotic lexicon. Okay. So, I, and you've got all those on there. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. See, now, that way he's doing precisely what I'm doing, but he doesn't have the total advantage of all the dimensions of this. Let, let me show you what, what I'm talking about here. The, the word follow. All right. Now, do you have the Greek text there? Do you have a no. Greek text? No. Okay. So, so here's what, now let me explain to you how this book works. Here's a good example, the word follow. Okay, you look up the word follow in English, alphabetical order. So here it is, follow or follow after. Then it gives you all the Greek words in the New Testament that translate into our English word follow. Let me tell you what they are. Akalutheo, ex akalutheo. That's obviously the same word with a prefix exit terminology, or out of, means to follow up or to follow out, or out to the, you followed all the way out to the pursuing the end of it. Epa kalutho, kalutheo, that ep epa means after, so it means to follow after. Kata kalutheo, um, kata means uh, behind. Uh, so it means to follow like I'm walking behind him or he's walking behind me. Now, you should recognize this one, parakalutheo. What does para mean? Alongside. All right. So you follow alongside. You're walking side by side with this person. These are the different Greek words. And you see after akalutheo, every word has a prefix. Ex akalutheo, ep akalutheo, kata Kalutheo, parakule kalutheo. So you get the idea that what you've got here so far on this page, you've got five words based on the Greek word akalutheo, the word for follow, and the prefix determines how the word then is used to follow out to the end of, to follow after something, to follow behind something, and to follow side by side. Well, now that's what those are five. Now listen. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are ten words, ten Greek words, so you can tell this is a very prominent word in the Greek language, the word follow. But here's the good news. It's also a very prominent word in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't use the same words, or he wouldn't have all ten of these in here. So how are we going to find out which one it is here? Be followers of me. Well, you look down in the you look down under these words till you come to 1 Corinthians 11 1. So let me see if I can find it. it may take just a minute to show you how to use this. See, we really need this on a PowerPoint or something where we can see it. So you look right down under every one of these words till you come to 1 Corinthians 11 1. And I don't see it so far. 1 Corinthians 11 1. It should be Holy Smith. Let me see if I got a follower. No. Well, that's a great word here. Do you any good? Yeah. yeah. Toss it over. Yes, it is. I, uh, I can tell you that I think pretty quickly. I, I may have missed this here in, in 1 Corinthians 11. Let me look up John 21, where he said, follow me. He usually has every reference in the New Testament, but if there are so many, it sometimes is selected. Yes, yeah. See, and there are a lot of them here, so no, here, man, it would probably, I've got two of those. Okay. It'd probably be... Uh, 
See, in, in John 21, when, John, when, Peter, um, when, when uh, Peter said, what, what about this man? He said, that's none of your business. Yeah. You follow me. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying. I'm looking to see if I can find out which word that is. But this word is used so often that he's very selective in the or else he'd fill the half of It may be so commonly used they might not really break it out sometimes. Well, but that's unusual. Yeah. It's usually not the case. Um, for example, in John 1 it says, In the day following, I saw Jesus walking, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away. Well, that's the word... It, Epi, it's epimi, epimi is the word, and that comes from bimbeobai, that word right there. Yeah. To imitate, to be an imitator, is to, is is so translated always in the RV. Let's see, with the nouns mimitase and imitator, or sum imitase and imitator together. See, sum, s u m or s u n, is the word we get a word sympathy, s y m. It's Pathy means to suffer. Sum means together with. And so, sum mimites means a, a, an imitator with somebody else. Like he and I start imitating you. Okay, we're fellow imitators. We're sum im, sum imitates. Um, but I don't see that word in here, so that's not a good example. We'll, we'll stay with it. Let's go back to Hebrews 12. Okay, Hebrews. Yeah, in his Bible. Hebrews 12, now the reason I asked a minute ago, is located right up on the heels of Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter. Now, is that important? Well, hold it in mind, let's see if it's important. Let me show you how important it is. Look at Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Now, here's the question. Isolate that phrase, the sin which doth so easily beset us. What is he talking about? This is the, this is the proof text that is always used when a preacher is preaching on besetting sins. Unbelief. All right, he's only talking about one sin. See, this is not a proof text on besetting sins. It's only talking about one sin. The sin, which, which actually the word means to well surround. Now see, here's where we get the help here. To miss the mark. Well, no, it's not, that's not it at all. That's the word sin, but it's, what is the, the missing oh, you mean of the mark? What, the, sin, the sin itself is? Yes. Oh, okay. It's unbelief. Oh, okay. The missing of the mark which is the definition of sin, is unbelief. Okay. In other words, the book of Hebrews, now this is a little tough, but it's still true, only essentially deals with one sin. That's what it's about. And there are a whole lot of sins mentioned, a whole lot of sins dealt with, but the book of Hebrews essentially deals with one sin. Are you going to trust Christ? Or are you going to turn back to Judaism? Are you going to believe Him? Are you going to receive Him? Are you going to go back to what you came from? Are you going to go back for the colorful aspects of Judaism or come back for an invisible anchor in an eternal world in Jesus? And so he says, lay aside the sin which does so easily, the word, it, it, it's one word, it means to well surround us like a garment. So you can already see this is a big passage. Mike, do you have any any particular part of it that really, really speaks to you? All of it, I guess. All of it, yeah. yeah it's, it is classic. It's huge. Have we ever done this one in our group? Uh, we haven't? I think we have. I'll go back and look, but I, if we haven't, we'll do it. But uh, now, notice what he says. What does he mean in the first part of verse 1, 12 1, when he says, Notice the wherefore, which connects this passage immediately as a deductive passage. In other words, he deduces these counsels from the faith chapter. Is everybody following me? In other words, here are his conclusions based on the faith chapter. He has just finished, and this is a good chapter division here. 
even though it starts and uh, it's a connection with that which precedes it, it's a takeoff from it, so there's a, this is a good chapter division. It, it'd be okay to have a long, long one, but it would be too long, so they divided it here. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, what does that mean? Friends and brothers, you know? But who are they? Saints. Uh, referred to back in chapter 11. All right. It's all the saints walking by faith in chapter 11. Seeing we are compassed about with so great a mass of, and this is the word martus, testifiers. Many of them martyrs, which is actually the meaning of the word. The, the primary meaning is those who are willing to die. And out of that, they're, they're solid testifiers concerning Jesus. They're not spectators. They're not observers. They're not for us to watch. They have witnessed to us. This got a good strong example. Says, those who, after his example, have proved the strength and gen genuineness of their faith in Christ by undergoing a violent death. Yes. And now, that's not necessary, but it's included. In other words, not all of those were martyrs, yes. but it is included. You follow what I'm saying? Not everybody in Hebrews 11 was a martyr, but there were many martyrs in Hebrews 11. And the word translated witnesses, it has a twofold meaning. And the first meaning is martyr, and the second one is witness or testimony. So these people, now question, are these, are these, whatever you want to call them here, testifiers, witnesses, observers, are, are, are we, are they spectators of us or observers of us or are we watching them? Or are they testifying to us? In other words, are these people watching us right now? I say your answer is yes. Everything you say. <laughs> <laughs> well, think real carefully. Now, in other words, is he talking about them being a cloud of people watching us now, or a cloud of people being our encouraging witnesses now? I believe that's what. It's. Yeah, I do too. Encouraging. It's the second one. I don't think they see us now. <laughs> I don't believe anybody in heaven sees me now. Oh, okay. Yeah. It'd be a miserable situation. It would introduce <laughs> yeah. some yeah. bad things into heaven if they right. did. I, I doubt that they see me now. I, I, I don't You're make right. that an they issue. They don't see us. <laughs> no, that would, I, I, I don't want to make that an issue, but I doubt that they see me now. Now, what he's talking about here is these people have preceded us in the race, and they are testifying to us, be faithful, it pays off. We've been the course. We've run the race. We know the rewards. They're not witnesses in the sense that they're looking at us. They're witnesses in the sense that they're giving us their encouragement. They are. Huh? They're witnesses because they are. Yeah, well, and their history, I mean, I can't read this without them encouraging me. Oh, yeah, as if the witnesses did that are in chapter 11 of these people. Yeah. Well, these the witnesses here are all the saints mentioned in chapter 11. Those who by faith did this, and by faith did this, and by faith. He said, seeing we also are, this word, well, let me look this word up. Look that up, Ralph. What is it? It's the word compassed in the King James Bible. Look it up just like that. Compass, C-O-M-P-A-S-S-E-D. This is here, says surrounded. Okay, that's, that's exactly what that means. This is the picture of, of people in an amphitheater or a grandstand. This is the picture of a race is what this is. And the grandstand is full of people shouting their encouragement to us is the idea. Now, let me see this word see if I can find compass. Yeah, round. Yeah, here it is. Um, It's, uh, it means to, to compass about as of a city encompassed by armies. That's what that means. Or stood in Acts 14, it's translated stood round about. 
in Hebrews 11, there it is, Hebrews 11.30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down and they were compassed about seven days. Means they were surrounded seven days. So here's the idea of a, of a grandstand surrounding the racetrack where we're presently running the race for Christ. It's a symbolic picture. And it's full of these people who've already run the race who are saying, go for the gold because it pays off. We've been there. You're You'll, not like walking into a, a room and you got a bunch like a, like a Civil War room and got all these great generals there around there. And you walk in there. Now, if they can be your heroes, then they're going to encourage you yeah. if they're just neutral observers to you. One of my, the best pictures I ever remember of this, and it slugged me between the eyes, I was reading the passage when I saw this movie on television. You've probably seen it. It's an old movie, an excellent uh, end, of the war, end of the war movie. Judgment at Nuremberg had Spencer Tracy in it. Well, he's the lawyer trying these war criminals. And in the lull, in the, the, it's a very, very tense trial, you can imagine. And they have a break, and he goes out walking through Nuremberg all by himself and walks into the stadium where all these stands are all around, empty stands of, say, 80,000 people, empty. And all of a sudden, his mind imagines these stands full of people observing everything they're doing. Now, that's a picture of what this is right here. I've got a living picture. When we walked in Winchester down there yeah. in London, you was just... You know, you, you know, you know, all these poets and everything. You, 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 was, you was wild about them. Yeah, you don't have any idea what that meant to me. <laughs> and the same thing, I'll tell you what the highlight of my Scotland trip was. Um, and I didn't think we were going to get to do it. My whole goal in going to Scotland, Judy didn't even have to know this because she doesn't have any appreciation of literature. It was to go to Abbotsford and see Sir Walter Scott's place which he built out of a fortune he made by writing and um, and then go to the writers museum in, in Edinburgh well when we got there and started to sign on to the tour to go to Abbotsford it had been canceled because of no participation nobody goes to the borders they all go to the highlands for because of reputation highlands have high reputation borders but the borders are borders is the south part of Scotland that borders with England, so it's named the Borders. And it's a big area down there. I don't say big, it's a small country, but it's a big area in that small country. And it's absolutely spectacular, but nobody knows about it. Only some people who have an interest will go down there. So they canceled that trip, and I didn't think I was going to get to go. And so we came up to the next to the last day, the evening before the next to the last day, and we went to the information center to because we had reserved the Edinburgh Castle to the last day. We wanted to go in and find the best vantage points and how to miss most crowds of everything like that. So we went to the information center. We're standing in line. There are about 20 people in front of us. And there's this big case of brochures of places to see. You'll see them everywhere. Well, I just thoughtlessly reached in and pulled one out, standing in line waiting for the people to move on up. Opened it up, and the first thing I saw was <laughs> tour to Abbotsford. And guess what day of the week it ran? The next day. Our next to the last day. The only day of the week it ran. I said, hey, there's a chance we might be able to get on this. And I immediately went and called them. They said, yes, we have some openings. So we signed on immediately. It was the absolute highlight of my, my trip. And I had one glorious trip ever. I, I'm Scottish. There's just no way to get around it. I'm Scottish. I'm Scotch-Irish, but from my mother's side. My father was German. And uh, and I just had a glorious time. I could have spent a week at Abbotsford alone. It's the most fascinating house I've ever seen. He was a collector of international artifacts. For example, when the Battle of Waterloo was fought, two days later he was on the battlefield. He went from Scotland to Waterloo. Being up to <laughs> Oh, yeah, he got the sword of, of, uh, of uh, Wellington. Can you believe that? He got, he got all these artifacts from the battlefield or talked the generals out of them, something like that. He was an incredible man, Walter Scott was. And, and then, after that, we went back to England and we couldn't find the writer's museum. Nobody knew where it was. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so we're coming back from the castle, and we stumble onto a tiny little sign on one of the closes. You, you, you have these real narrow archways, they're called closes or closes, and you walk down this and there, it's real dark down through there, and you come out into a big courtyard on the other side. And off of the Miracle Mile, there's this little place that said Writer's Museum, and I just happened to see it. And we walked down there, and I spent a half a day in the Writer's Museum, and I bought three biographies of Walter Scott. I've already read two of them. I'm working on the third one now. He's the most fascinating character, I think, in history that I've read after. His, his life story is better than any of his writings. He wrote some incredible books, but to me, his life story is better than his writings. But See, that's the way you see this. See, you saw that. You talked about all those poets and everything. Well, you're right. I see that that way. That's like an athlete seeing a picture of Herschel Walker and setting his goals because he, he sees the example he set. There's more than that here. He's saying these people are actually, as it were, by their example, encouraging us. So this is the idea here. And the word compass means to surround about. See, see, we're surrounded with so great a mass of martyr witnesses. It's Hebrews 11. Now, let us, and then comes a series of let us. Let us lay aside something and let us run some way. So there are two let us expressions here. And they're both massive. I can see how. Anybody would make this a favorite. In fact, this this would be well to be somebody's life motto passage. Uh, notice the negative side. Let us lay aside every weight. Uh, I'm going to take a chance. Look that up, Ralph. Wait. Well, look up lay aside. I don't know okay, whether, we can, okay, I don't know whether we can get that together right, or not. Lay aside is to put away or, or aside or away. And it is even further because to say a separation. Okay. Uh, now, do you see anything about Hebrews 12.1 there? The reason I'm asking is because this is a negative prefix word. I don't remember what it is. It's a well, I'll give you another example of a negative prefix word, which I do remember. Look at chapter, look at verse 2 here in this chapter. Boy, this is big. Does, does anybody have a translation that it says something? It says, looking unto Jesus. Does anyone have a, what does your translation say? Fixing our eyes. Fixing our eyes. On Jesus? Mm -hmm. Okay, now that, that's good for what it says, but it leaves out something. Anybody else got another one? See, I, I've never seen a translation that puts this in there. But the, the, what, is, what does it say, looking unto, verse two? Mine just says looking unto Jesus. Okay. I, I can tell you what it says in, in the uh, Amplified. Okay, what does it say? Yeah, the Amplified puts in about 10 translations. Now everybody watch this carefully. And I'll show you why it's so important to study your Bible linguistically. To don't take anything for granted. See, my translation leaves out a very important idea. But it's, uh, it's almost hidden. It's just one letter in the Greek text. What does it say, Amplified? Can you find it? Away. Uh -huh. Wait a minute. Hold on. All that will distract. Now hold on. Did everybody hear that? The, the, word, the word horao means looking. Aphorao means looking away from. So this doesn't just say looking unto Jesus. It says looking away from everything else that would distract. Now what else does it say? To Jesus. Who? To Jesus. That's good enough. Now st say that again. That's slowly. Looking away from all that will distract. To Jesus. All right, now there it is. See, they, my King James leaves out the negative prefix there. It's called an alpha privative. It means it, it, it neg negates what was said in some way. So it says, looking away from everything else unto Jesus. See, that is much bigger than simply looking to Jesus. 
He's actually guarding your gaze there. Guarding it against anything that would distort the view of Jesus or distract you from it. Boy, is this a giant text. But the whole New Testament is this way. All of it's this way. You cannot exhaust it with a single translation. It's too big. I know so, uh, it says that because up above it says we're so easily ensnared us. Yeah. And he's talking about that sin. The sin. Unbelief. Yeah. I, or the, any weight. See, he starts off by saying, let us lay aside every weight. Now, there are a lot of things that are weights that are not sins. But if you're going to run the race properly, you're going to have to get rid of the weights as well as the sins. Oh. It's amazing when you read these in the Amplified, even the first verse. Okay, say it again. The first verse? Yeah. The whole first verse? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, the Amplified is the best single yeah. Bible study yeah, yeah. you, you can, can get. Yeah. You can preach it. <laughs> I carry it with, yeah. I've carried it with me around the world probably. Therefore, oh, how many times? therefore then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, un every unnecessary way, <laughs> and that sin which so readily defy and cleverly clings to and, ent and entangles us, let us run with patience and endurance. And All right, steady. the key word there, Paul's been... The word, more than patience, the word is endurance. endurance. Endurance has a persistence about it that mere patience. Patience is passive. Endurance is aggressive. Okay, go patience, ahead. endurance, and steady and active persistence. I oh, love that. The anointed course of the race that is set before you. Now, no, wait, it doesn't say anointed, does it? Did I read the word wrong? Say appointed? The appointed, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah it is the appointed. Okay, course. now, the word race... Boy, this is so big. We're going to have to stop pretty quickly, and I hate that. But let me read that again and sort of pick at it a little bit. Seeing we're surrounded with so great a mass of testifiers, let us... Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember what, what that word is, but I can't remember. Let us strip off every weight. Now, remember when a runner trains... What does he put on himself? Lightweight. Well, he puts on weights on his ankles. Drink. And he can carry weights in his hands. Why? So when he takes them off, he'll run lighter. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he that's exactly what he's saying here. Let us strip off. Notice it's not, it's not something moral in this case. It's something that simply slows us down. That's gigantic. In other words, a person who is really a vocational Christian will be much more meticulous than the person who's casual. The person who's casual will take all those weights and won't make any difference. You know, that is amazing. You something that this says unnecessary weight. How much weight do we carry that we think is necessary? Well, especially... When in fact, it's not. Well, I just, I've just come from one society after another where they, they're going to embarrass us at the judgment seat of Christ like you wouldn't believe. I just read today... They, this is the 25th anniversary of Asia for Christ. And, and K.P. Yohannan is a magnificent man of God. I, I mean, and, and he tells rather reluctantly upon prodding, he tells about what he underwent to get that started. He said, I, I would speak to a hundred churches here in the States and nobody showed any interest. And he said, I would go back to my car and just bend over the wheel and just weep and weep and weep. Because I felt God had laid this on my heart and nobody was interested. Now you ought to read the history 25 years later, but it's because the man in the purging of testing stayed faithful. There's running with patience, persistence, endurance, the race that is set before you. And how he gave up everything. He sold, he, had a, he was driving a brand new car, business related. And he sold it in order to put all the proceeds in the organization and drove an old clunker that he said just barely would get him anywhere. And just a whole lot of dimensions of that. And I wonder what's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ. When affluence and culture and leisure, and culturated affluence are taken for granted in our culture. And so when an American has to tighten his belt, guess what he does? He gripes and complains to daylight 
they like the doctor. But he says, lay aside every weight and the sin which does well surround us is the, is the idea, is the, is the word. Well surround us. That's the negative side. Two things to put aside. Obviously, sin would be one, but the other is any encumbrance that holds us back. And let us run with patience, with endurance. Now notice that that means that this is not a wind sprint. This is a marathon race. This is like a, it's a distance race that's over against a wind sprint, like a 100 or 220 or 440. This is more of a two mile race or a 24 mile race. So you pace yourself knowing you've got a long way to go. Let us run with endurance the, wow, does anyone know what this word is? It's the word agona, A-G-O-N-A. -A. We get our word agony from it. That's the way they pictured a race. If it didn't tax you and test you, it wasn't a contest. And this word is used over and over again, and it gives us a verb form to agonizomai. It means to agonize over something. It's a word for used, used for how we're to pray in Romans 15. Let us run with endurance the agony, and Ralph read it a minute ago, read it first anointed. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think that was right, but I can understand how you see that, but it's, it, it's, a, it's a race that is appointed to us. In other words, we do not get to choose our starting lane or the lane in which we run. It's already set out for us. And the inspiration for this is looking away from everything else unto Jesus, who is the, this is the same word that in Hebrews 2 is translated captain and completer of, now the, my King James Version says, the author and finisher of our faith, but the word our is not in the text. He's the author and finisher of faith, period. He's the one who established the faith way. He's the one who commands the faith way. Now, does it, someone read it out of your translation. First part of verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. All right. See, now my King James Bible says our faith. Mm -hmm. That's a good translation to the author and perfecter. He is the founder and finisher of faith. In other words, he's the one that sponsors it all the way through. It is only by faith who for the joy that was set before him. Now notice verse 1 says, there's a race set before us. And our inspiration is, someone precedes us who had something set before him. Two things. The joy set before him. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame. In other words, he treated with contempt the shame that would mean probably so much to us, and he is set down at the right hand of God, right hand of the throne of God. And now here's an interesting thing. Verse 3 begins, for consider him, and the word consider, Ralph, look that one up. This is a big It's a what? Let me get my change my program to that. Okay. You don't look at the meaning of the word? Yeah, the word consider in uh, in, in Hebrews 12, 3. Okay. It sounds like that movie about where that paint horse and that guy went over. It's supposed to be the true story. He went overseas and ran in an Arab race. Yeah. But um, he knows him. He knows You know, he didn't know the trail or he didn't know the track. You know, he just went there and did it. And won it. And won it. <laughs> a little, a little, a little, uh, Mustang. Yeah, yeah. Beat the big, big first meaning of it is to think over, to ponder. All right, now, do you have any Greek word there? Uh, Can you find the Greek word there? I didn't find that you would have an answer. Hope, home, in, something. H O O P dash O M dash E N. Hope and name. Yeah, no, that's a, that's not the word that's oh, used wait, here. Wait, that's, 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's here. not the word that's used here. The word here is analogizomai. No, I, I, I drop that. Go ahead. That's right. You, what you just said. Analogizomai. Now, don't let this throw you. There. Are, let me show you how many words, Greek words, there are that could be translated consider. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And every one of these words has a specialty. Now, one of them is logizomai. It means to take an account of. You have to see analog. And then, all right, now, th th this one is analogizomai. It's logizomai with a prefix. Now, what was the word you just said? Analog. All right, that's where we get our word analogy. This is where we get our word. So here's what this says. Make an analogy between you and Jesus. That's what that says. Consider him. But there's so much more than that there. It actually says, uh, how, how shall I put it? The only way you can put it is to translate it. Draw an analogy between yourself and him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. In other words, let him be your example and keep on running. <laughs> Is this you can break that down. Well, that gets into several different layers. Doesn't of, it? Of meanings here, yeah. It really does. It, uh, it, this is, these are really, really intriguing. See, this is what I find about wordcraft. It's such an intriguing thing. I mean, I can go to my study and spend hours getting two minutes of presentation. But I have to reduce it to two minutes because if you gave it all, you'd wear some people out. But the student, you'd never wear out at all because he'll never get enough of it. He's just started. And I hear somebody teach like this, and it sets me on fire. It, I'm back in my study immediately. I had that happen this weekend. You know, you really don't have an under, a true deep understanding of what you study. There's no way you can. No. Because, see, I've already showed you some things about my English translation rob you. For example, that word looking unto Jesus. There's no wasn't a translation in this room, but these are good translations that put in that little alpha primitive, which means the, the negative, looking away from everything else unto Jesus. So if you study, you'll get this. If you don't, you just have to take it. It's good enough there. Oh, no, it's not good enough. The text says something else. It adds something to looking to Jesus. It's looking away from everything else and unto Jesus. Not merely at Jesus, but away from and unto Jesus. So what he's saying is, verse 3 Make a comparison between Jesus and yourself. Take a lesson from that comparison and let your race be determined by what you see in him. And the thing he majors on is that he endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. And draw an analogy between yourself and him at that point, verse 3, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Oh, this is a I pity the person that thinks the Bible is just written by humans. <laughs> I you know, pity. I was in the church. I don't want to take away from me. No, we're going to stop. Was, I was in a church, in a black church in Stuttgart, Arkansas, about a month ago. And I walked into the auditorium and I sat down in the back. And there was a Sunday school class going on in the front. No adults, I don't know what And some man began to speak. And I realized I began to listen to him. He said, you know, he made comments about people who study the Bible and look for deeper meanings. He said, all you need to know is just what it says. <laughs> yeah, well, that's enough. He but, was the pastor. Yeah. But the but see, now why? I know. I mean, that's what I'm saying. He missed so much. I know, but why? He's never been taught. Right. Exactly. He himself has never exactly. been taught. Exactly right. He talked about the Baptist, and I got a brass down there. <laughs> <laughs> But it doesn't matter. God's yeah. word's got word. That's right. <laughs> well, I, of course, all we can do in a case like this is but go find this out ourselves and enjoy it and then use what we can with somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, uh, even even our youth pastor that was in our church said that you didn't, you know, you didn't have to stay at a great deal of what it says. 
Well, no, you don't have to, but I'm sure it sure does open a whole lot of meetings. I mean, you've got a translation here, and it, I'm not saying it's untrustworthy. It is trustworthy. It just can't be ample because no translation can be ample. So you have to dig in for yourself. And the, the good thing today is we have such incredible helps. I, I can do now in five minutes what it took me five hours to do when I finished seminary. If I take a paragraph of scripture, I can search, I can research it in five minutes and reach the bottom of that text. And I'm never satisfied because every time I read something else, it will suggest other things. It will show other things, other light to throw on it. So I, I always try to read everything I have on any text when I'm getting ready to preach on everything. And that's a lot of stuff. But I don't, I'm not satisfied if I haven't done that. I believe I owe it to the person listening to me to expose the minds of the ages that God has spoken to about this text. Right. And, and so it's up to me, and not everybody, of course, has that vocation, but I feel it's incumbent upon me to do that. That's I me. Mean, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't understand what I don't think. You take John 8, 12, a short verse. Light but it's hours of explanation. Oh, yeah, well, easily. And, and people are just amazed. Just like their eyes are just been turned on. There you are. Well, and that's what it's for. That's what a teacher is for. He's to show up and throw light on something they they haven't seen yet. It's like the eunuch jogging along on the carriage and Philip came along and he said, Do you understand what you're reading? Well, all he was reading was the easiest passage to understand on the atonement of the Old Testament, but he didn't know that. And he said, How can I unless somebody teach me? It says, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the same scripture he preached unto him Jesus. Actually, he, it's the word he gospelized, he good news to him to yeah. Jesus. Well, let's stop there. A lot more to say here. I appreciate that suggestion. I'll <laughs> get it started anyway.